and sharing their poems with audiences in front of them whose responses or silences and feedback also after the gigs in the pub and the parties there was immediate response and feedback which conditioned what we went on to do unlike the very strictly closed and official um, poetry rules of the past which insisted on going through kind of um, gauntlet runs of contact making in the old school way of uh, oh you ought to cultivate this or that critic and so Alvarez can be regarded as having helped to invent Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes and Robert Lowell although that area marks another kind of breaking of taboos and old assumptions because Alvarez and other people like him did do quite a lot to bridge the great gap between England or Britain or between England and Britain and Britain from America. The Atlantic has been called since by Blake since the since 1800 the sea of error and of course in America you had Whitman, you had Emily Dickinson, you had so many brilliant poets throughout the last century who opened and opened and opened and overlapped with their great new traditions of blues and folk and rock and gospel mm. and rap etc. Well, which why continue did, now. Why did Blake seem so much somebody uh, that was very relevant to what you were doing or where did you first come across him? Well I first came across the name and work of William Blake at primary school, one of the when my German Jewish refugee family were evacuated in the Second World War to various places including Cheam, Surrey. I went to Dunstan Road Church Junior School and went through all sorts of strange culture conditionings because I'd been carefully as the youngest of ten children protected against knowledge of hundreds and thousands of millions of human beings on the planet who weren't Orthodox Jews, let alone Orthodox German Jews, emigrated from Nazi Germany. So all that had, I'd been sheltered from. So when at Johnson Road Church School, all the kids except me delightedly did some singing rather than having to think about lessons and reading and writing, songs like praise him, praise him and little lamb who made thee and so on. So whilst being worried that this is all very Christian, especially at Christmas time when they sing once in lowly David said he stood at a cattle shed and all this stuff about Jesus and King of the Jews and Jerusalem as somebody very aware that I was a Jew, I felt terribly threatened and frightened and some of the other kids couldn't understand me being a Jew who wasn't a kind of nice Christmas Jew in the carols, but a German Jew whom their parents' dads were fighting in Germany, and they couldn't understand it, and they said, um, well, I put in an autobiographical poem, you're a Jerry, they said, you're a German, they're a Jerry, they said at school, you're a, a German, and you go to shul, and then they nicknamed me, and hard punch horror fist I became and fought for our common humanity. So the, all this thing of nicknames and playground bullying, I had to do a sort of Tom Brown school days and sort of fought my way into mutual respect and internationalism at an early age. But William Blake was very, very central to a very proactive evolution from me out of these difficult discontents of early childhood because in even those early songs that I then came to read in the little book, Songs of Innocence and Experience, Infant Joy, Little Lamb Who Made the... Um, and his, I looked at his engravings, like, to quote, illustrating Shakespeare, Macbeth, Pity like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast. It also looked like the big books of the Bible. My dad used to set me on his knee and we'd read the, the Old Testament in, in the great mm. Gustav Dore illustrated by with these huge engravings which more than the text, though goodness knows the text, or perhaps I should say God, or as Jews put it, G hyphen D, so you didn't take the Lord thy God's name in vain. All God's 
all this religious stuff in the Bible I found in Blake revamped beautifully in a much more kindly post-Christian pantheistic pan-global philosophy that was more a reflection of what I experienced growing up which was of, of nature of supernature, of the divine vision, humanity, naked human beings with dicks and breasts and and putting all that into his writing from the early very simple songs through all the different proses and early works, the songs of revolution, the proverbs of heaven and hell with all their remarkable graphic, both literally graphic as he engraved pictures with them and emotionally and imaginatively no bird flies too high if he flies with his own wings, and knowest thou not that every bird that cuts the airy way is a world of infinite delight closed to thy senses five. So all these extraordinary revelations, so beautifully put and doing so much better the job my family tried to drum into me as the great achievement of the Old Testament and the Jewish religion, which historically, of course, was remarkable in surviving so virtually intact over all the the five millennia or so. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary, but the way it continued to be rammed home in the fundamentalist um, manners, which still plague us all today so horrendously, was was wonderfully transmuted in the works of William Blake, and then following him the works of Walt Whitman, the works of Allen Ginsberg, and the mm -hmm. works of our friends who were continuing to branch mm. out from all that tradition of revolutionary, libertarian, open-hearted yeah. and open-formed expression that we were able to inherit and draw on and consolidate. The people who did things in the 60s are always thought to be of that era, and it was obviously an important time for you, but do you feel that that's where sort of everything springs for you? Or what other times in your life have felt... Um, major. Well, every moment. I have to say I'm distressed at the increasing... When I think of Estragon in, in Waiting for God, uh, people are bloody ignorant apes. Because just a week ago I was characterised and quoted in the, the Londoner's Diary of the Evening Standard for... Um, there was this television series, The Hour, do you remember? Mm, yeah. And there was a bit of a hoo-ha saying, oh, well, The Hour, this documentary, it traded on being like a 50s TV doco, a news documentary, and, and a lot of people wrote in and, and fetched in blogs. It wasn't like that at all. A few people came out of the cupboard and said, I produced that new first news programme. We never said things like farting about or you just don't get it. <laughs> so I just happened to be writing to one of the Londoner's Diary editors about something else, in fact about the marginalising of Poetry Olympics from the so-called next year's Cultural Olympiad, which was what I wanted them to to mention somewhere, especially as I'm one of the 8,000 people hopefully in the running to become a torchbearer hey. in front of the Olympic Games. Well, it's one chance in 8,000, so I probably won't get it. <laughs> they had published a photo of me along with eight other would-be torchbearers. So I wrote to one of the editors, whom I know, and have sometimes had a kind of adversarial, mutually satirical relationship, because I constantly try to debunk their formulaic way of commenting on the comedies of the day and get them to raise their act a little bit and they in turn get back at me saying ah oh, come on you're always hustling for poetry we've heard it all before from you too sort of thing. <laughs> anyway instead of publishing and recycling my kvetch against Lockhog, Ruth McKenzie et al for willfully because many people uh, petitioned them to include some aspect of Poetry Olympics as we have the track record biggest audience ever in Europe that we've heard of for poetry at Albert Hall in 65 and almost the only outfit anyone's told me about that's put the words anything cultural together with anything Olympics but no we just got little sort of piss off notes from secretaries of secretaries but saying if you fill in 17 forms in 
caught up the curtain and took every box we might consider you with all the others. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I said the language of the hour for my money, and I did watch those programmes then, was a co-editor of ISIS, the Oxford magazine. We used almost every phrase, the writer, Abby, Abigail, somebody. I mean, I loved the hour. Every episode I was able to catch was spot on for me, and it had a great storyline, great acting. But what I loved most of all was the language. I didn't like all the smoking, being a, an unhappily addicted cigarette smoker for many years and now being absolutely allergic to it and having to cross the road within a hundred yards of a smoker. Utterly pathological. <laughs> Nothing I'm pleased about. But of course everyone did smoke all the time in the 50s, mm -hmm. nearly everyone I knew, including me, so I can't really be too passionate about anti-smoking. But I said, I remembered putting a headline to a piece by a very nice chap who's still just alive called Patrick Garland, who was then one mm. of the kind of queens of Oxford University drama and had started getting apprentice jobs in the West End, about which experience he wrote an article about the fun and games backstage with everyone, Gilgood, Olivier, stage managers, pissed off cleaners, etc. It was a very good article. And we called it, I think even quoting him in the article, as standard headline writers still do today, farting about on the West End boards. And we quoted all the time, were saying things like, you don't get it, do you? And some other people had written in, including Norman Lebrecht and Jonathan Green, a, mm. a highly reputed lexicographer of slang, saying their slang in the hour was wrong. And um, I said, S some of these so-called pontiffs or authorities, including Jonathan and Lebrecht, really ought to be mindful that it always takes dictionaries, and it seems even people as venerable as themselves, ages to cap catch up on the language of the streets. Yeah. And uh, unhappily it's left as if we didn't have enough work to do to the likes of us poets, to keep the dialects of the tribe actually contemporary. Mm, mm. So the editor of London's Diary published this, but, sorry, it's a very long digression to explain <laughs> why I'm not a 60s poet. He <laughs> characterised me as 60s poet Michael Horowitz, who should know, i.e. I died in 1969. <laughs> Fuck him, you know. <laughs> I've got to see who this is.